everybody, and welcome to Project HR, a podcast dedicated to building better workplaces. Project HR is brought to you by IRI Consultants. IRI helps organizations navigate workplace challenges, improve employee engagement and productivity, manage labor relations, and implement effective communication strategies to achieve their goals. For more information, you can visit IRI at IRIConsultants.com. I am Jennifer Oroqua, Director of Business Development for IRI, and your host for today's episode of Project HR. Now, in recent years, we've spent a lot of energy thinking about the upcoming generations of employees. While we've been adapting our recruiting strategies to better serve these younger workers, unions have been adapting their organizing strategies to better appeal to them. These new strategies engage employees in social media spaces, and they're carried out by a new generation of union organizers who understand digital tactics as well as social media algorithms. Today, I have the privilege of talking with employment and law attorney Daniel Schwartz, partner at Shipman and Goodwin. He is also the creator of the Connecticut Employment Law Blog, and he's here to provide his perspective on, among other things, labor's TikTok tactics. Welcome to Project HR, Dan. Hey, Jen. Nice to be with you. Now, this episode was inspired by a blog article that you wrote back in May titled The New Digital Campaign for Your Company's Workers. And you start off the article with a bit of a challenge for your readers to gauge their own familiarity with a popular TikTok meme. Are your readers typically current on all the latest viral dances? No, uh, but to reference another TikTok dance, uh, it's about damn time uh, that they (laughs) probably are. I, you know, that that said, look, I, I, I think it really varies. I think some Gen Z uh, are certainly familiar with it and really um, plan their their activities uh, around that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would also say that people with kids uh, are starting to get into it, too. And that's what got me hooked uh, mm-hmm. from it, from my daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same. I have a, an 18 year old. And when I mentioned the the one that you mentioned at the beginning of the article with the, the jiggle jiggle fold, you know, she, she knew exactly what I was talking about. I was like, oh, OK, I need to catch up here. So how important is it for professionals to take communication in these digital spaces seriously? Look, we've seen over the last 10 years, it's really important because there are a whole host of conversations that are going on uh, that you may just be unaware of. And, you know, it was great when employers and employees finally got on Facebook, but that's not where most of those conversations are going Mm -hmm. uh, on right now. They are all over the place. Um, And that's both a challenge and an opportunity, right? It's Mm -hmm. it's a a challenge because there's no single town hall that everyone's Mm -hmm. listening to. But uh, there's opportunity because there's lots of different ways to communicate with people and find them on their own terms. And TikTok uh, has caught lightning in a bottle Mm -hmm. and is the newest way that people are using to communicate. But just to confirm, it's not just TikTok. I mean, you alluded to this a second ago. We're all over the place. No, for sure. It's it it really is, and I I think. it's impossible to keep up with everything, right? You have limited resources. You can't be everything to everyone everywhere, but uh, that doesn't mean you have to give up either. And so I think if employers are just resting on, well, we're on Facebook, that's good enough. It's just not good enough uh, anymore. And you have employees now who don't watch TV, who don't read mm-hmm. uh, and subscribe to newspapers. So how are you going to communicate with them? Uh, and TikTok and YouTube have a viral and video component to it that adds some potency mm-hmm. uh, to things. But you know, WhatsApp, uh, Signal, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of those things are still in play as well. And I think many people in our industry think of digital organizing as union interest meetings on Facebook or, or emails from organizers. What would you include under the banner of digital organizing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's that and more, right? It's it union interest uh, meetings uh, are, are certainly a part of it. But now it's all about, hey, these are issues. These are topics that you should be interested in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and does your employer offer that? Um, so it's resetting the conversation to a set of expectations that people can subscribe to. Do you think your employer should have um, better scheduling? Uh, mm-hmm. Do you think your employer should offer certain paid benefits uh, about it? And educating people about that, uh, that's more what we're seeing now, which is topic-oriented uh, campaigns of which union organizing is a part of that, but it is it is not the driving focus. And, and look, it's smart, right? No mm-hmm. one likes to be sold to, mm-hmm. per se. Everyone 
no one likes advertising in a an upfront way. Mm -hmm. But if your friend says, hey, you know, find out about this, and then you can browse it and gauge your interest and learn more on your own time, mm -hmm. that's really what uh, digital campaigns have been moving towards. And it's very persuasive, you know, being in there, not being sold to, but, you know, being convinced to to take a look or explore this on your own. What sort of content have you seen or experienced that, that's being produced? What you're really seeing are short um, slick productions that are on TikTok uh, that look look like they're easy, mm -hmm. uh, look like they are just done by someone on their cell phone, but have a script, have a message. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, again, you're not talking about 10 minutes. You may be talking as short as 15, 30 seconds, mm -hmm. something that catches people's eyes as they're browsing. Mm -hmm. and I think it's important to understand that for many people who use, um, I'll just use TikTok for an example, there's a feature that really allow, allows people to scroll oh, you like this? Okay, we'll just keep scrolling up. And then the algorithm will keep feeding more videos of the mm -hmm. type. Yep. And so it is a, um, in some ways, uh, a self-creation, mm -hmm. all designed over your interests and what you like. So you like, and you've been watching uh, videos on uh, uh, union organizing, but that are slightly different, well, you're going to see more of that. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I learned from my kids, there's this whole subgenre on TikTok of Irish Obama videos, because what? apparently he had an ancestor. <laughs> and, and and who knew, but now my kids are like, well, that's all we start seeing on yeah. our uh, on our thing. There was she a sea shanty uh, videos that were <laughs> yes, going around six that. months ago. Yep. Uh, you know, and for me, I'm a, I'm suddenly in like this comedian loop where I'm seeing you know lots of comedians like Jim Gaffigan. Mm -hmm. It just is the algorithm. Mm -hmm. But I think the the slickness of the union organizing allows people to uh, sort of get into this a lot more easily than they otherwise would. Yeah. And that addictive nature, I feel like that that really helps with digital organizing. You know, what are the benefits for these kind of virtual campaign activities for unions? It's uh, cheap overall. Mm -hmm. It's effective, uh, number two. And three, it has much more of a reach than what you could previously do. I mean, think about 10, 15 years ago. If you were a union organizer, what were going to be your main tools that you were going to use? Well, you'd probably stand outside mm -hmm. the office. So when people came out, you would hand flyers mm -hmm. and you would try to get a phone number from someone, maybe at that point an email. It was very time consuming. It was mm -hmm. very one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Mm -hmm. This is, you can put out a campaign, um, you can boost it with an ad, mm -hmm. um, and you can get it out quickly, cheaply, uh, and uh, reach far more people than you could ever do physically. Plus, it can still be kind of covert. You know, when you were standing outside handing out flyers or knocking on doors or having meetings, you know, the employer finds out about that pretty quickly. Whereas if you're online and they're not on TikTok, <laughs> you, might, you might have an advantage there in terms of, of reaching those employees. That's 100%, which is if if you're an employer and you uh, get a petition for a, uh, a union to organize uh, and have a vote in your uh, facility, and that's the first time you're hearing about it, you're done. It's yeah. too late. Yeah, for sure. Uh, they already know they have, they have the advantage and they have the numbers mm -hmm. behind it. Yeah. So I think what's really important for employers to understand is uh, the battle for your workplace is going on now, mm -hmm. whether, you, whether you know about it or not, uh, and to be engaged in that, not in battle, but in discussions with your employees. Mm -hmm. Um, and in thinking about how do we get our own messages across. Fascinating. All right, Dan, I'm going to take a quick sponsorship break right now. But when we return, I want to talk about the role of interactivity in digital organizing campaigns. Stay with us. Are you confident that your supervisors know how to support your company's direct connection with employees? Even when you have the best intentions, and especially if your company is successful, unions may target your employees. 
How can you make sure that your managers and supervisors know how to support your union-free operating philosophy in a positive way? LaborWise Leadership e-learning will give your frontline leaders the training they need anywhere, anytime on any device. With interactive elements including videos, quizzes, and downloadable transcripts, LaborWise Leadership's curriculum covers all aspects of meeting employee needs while remaining union-free. Better still, you'll have the peace of mind that comes from knowing your leaders are well-trained and would never violate employee rights. Learn more and get a free demo or trial of LaborWise Leadership e-learning today at laborwiseleadership.com. I'm back with Dan Schwartz, partner at Shipman and Goodwin and the creator of the Connecticut Employment Law Blog. Now, Dan, are workers more open to digital organizing today? And if they are, why? You know, I'm not sure whether they are or are not. I think people have always been open to it, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, unions uh, come from a place where employees were frankly abused by their employers. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were no safety conditions. The Mm -hmm. pay was terrible. The Mm -hmm. hours were horrible. Um, And and unions came from from that place originally. Um, Now it's obviously developed over time. We're a hundred years removed uh, from some of that. But uh, many times unions, when they aren't in a place to begin with, come from a Um, come from dissatisfaction at work, a feeling that the employer has the advantage uh, in some ways. And if you think about the most recent campaigns now uh, at at places like Starbucks, some of it developed off the notion that the employer was taking advantage Mm -hmm. of the employees Mm -hmm. through scheduling and otherwise. Because it's not like Starbucks was uh, not offering decent pay or some benefits to right. people, but it w- but it was more than that. And I think what we're seeing, particularly over the last couple of years, is an uh, exacerbation of that with the pandemic, and all the changes that were happening were sped up ten times over the last couple of mm-hmm. years. That makes sense. Now, in the blog post that we talked about, you referenced a Wired article from last April titled, The TikTok Army is Coming for Union Busters. And it tells the tale of how online activists Gen Z for Change have targeted some big companies and made an impact. What kinds of strategies are we talking about? So the Gen Z for Change uh, is really one of those things that could only happen uh, now, right? Mm -hmm. It, It is a group of activists from a diverse set of backgrounds who have gotten together and are really um, trying to raise awareness and action on a whole variety of issues, not just uh, employment issues, but climate justice, Mm -hmm. criminal justice, education reform. And their strategies vary depending on the topics, but ultimately what they're really trying to do is get more people involved in the issues, give them a say, give them a voice, you know, pretty, I I think, worthy goals uh, overalls. But for a few employers, um, and, you know, on their website, they list, you know, Starbucks and Kroger's as two examples, they've been um, trying to be more creative in their approach, not simply to get employees to act, but to get other people to act as well. So uh, they've been flooding those employers with fake job applications to Mm -hmm. make it more challenging for the employers to hire it, but also to send a message too. It's, it's a, uh, It's a version of a petition on steroids. Hmm. Uh, How effective is it? I think that, you know, that's obviously a a still an open book, but uh, they've certainly engaged a whole new set of people uh, to be involved. And you sort of alluded to the idea of, you know, affecting the way the a company runs um, and thinks about the, the world at large um, and that pride in I work here and I feel good about that and that sense of fulfillment at work. How big of a role does that play, that that sense of belonging? And I'm proud to say where I work. Um, you know, is that a, is that a big, big deal as far as these this Gen Z for Change organization is? I think it is. I think what they're trying to do is send messages to companies to be good corporate citizens, or at least good corporate citizens in the way that this group Mm. uh, would define it. And everyone would have their own, obviously, set of of, of views on that point. Mm. I think what's interesting about this group is there's there's sort of an interactive element to this uh, tactic, a way for for all of us to, to, 
to be involved. And you could open up their website and click a button and allow them to run a script on your own computer that floods uh, the, uh, the employer with fake job applications. Mm. So it's, it's much more than simply, hey, we're going to do a campaign on the employer. It is allowing an army Mm-hmm. in some ways to interact and uh, send messages to employers in ways that the employers may not be fully prepared for. And so they encourage these these interactive elements and, and that sense of corporate social responsibility and, and want employees to take action even outside of, of organizing attempts. Is that right? Yeah, I, th- I think that's uh, that's true. I think they're they're trying to uh, again, give people different ways to expand their message, mm-hmm. to get their message uh, out. Um, but, you know, I, I, let me just take a step back for a second and think, you know, how would employers get into this in, in, in the first place? And part of it is, to get back to your prior question a little bit, controlling your message um, and allowing your employees to be part of that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I alluded to it before that if you're learning about campaigns, um, mm-hmm. y- you know, you're probably too late. Mm-hmm. You need to be having these conversations sooner and educating your employees, uh, not just on what you offer, but on the benefits that your workplace provides because of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not an anti union. Uh, message, but rather a pro-employer message, because no one really wants to be necessarily against uh, uh, something. They want to be part of something bigger. We know that that's a a, a very powerful uh, emotion, and allowing employees uh, to feel part of your employer's growth, your message, uh, that's a very powerful tool for employers to use. Yeah. So would you say that communicating that we're, we we understand corporate social responsibility, you know, as an organization, um, you know, this is important to us and really communicating that out, would you say that that's something that's sort of vital right now? I think so. I think it's these, the um, social issues have, have moved uh into the workplaces, employers can't really just sit back and go, we're, we're not going to talk about this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm hearing from employers uh, very recently that they want to start offering, for example, travel benefits mm-hmm. uh, for employees who need to get an abortion where mm-hmm. it may be outlawed mm-hmm. in their state. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a very interesting messaging now uh, coming from employers who are really trying to get ahead of the message. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've seen that on a national basis, you know, Dick Sporting Goods right. recently, uh, it, you know, said, we're, we're going to do this as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I think employers have to be uh, creative about it because their employees expect it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if other employers are doing it, you're going to get the questions, well, why isn't my employer doing mm-hmm. this? Do right. they not care about us? Mm-hmm. Do they not think it's important? Or even worse, are they against us mm-hmm. in some ways or against what I believe? Right. Uh, and uh, that's uh, that's a, a real challenge right now. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Dan, it's time for another quick break. We're going to be right back after this. You're listening to the Project HR Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Oroqua, and my guest today is Daniel Schwartz, partner at Shipman and Goodwin and the creator of the Connecticut Employment Law Blog, which has enjoyed a 15-year run now. I'm back. And Dan, in your blog, you mentioned the demise of corporate captive audience meetings and how that might impact our view of digital communication. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so captive audience meetings, just uh, it, so the audience is aware, were these a sort of conversations where employers would force employees to sit in front of, uh, you know, in a room for an hour or two and hear about the benefits that the employer has and why union would be bad for the employer. And they were never very popular to begin with. Their effectiveness varied. Um, But that was the main way that a a lot of employers used to communicate their message. Uh, Now we're seeing in legislation and in reinterpretations of federal law that uh, certain states are now making it illegal 
for employers to force employees to sit through those types of meetings or meetings that are deemed political or religious Mm -hmm. uh, in nature. Mm -hmm. We'll see if that withstands judicial scrutiny, but that's really besides the point at this point. Mm -hmm. I I think um, employers need to be where your employees are. And uh, you want to use captive audience meetings because someone's told you that's a good idea. That's up to you. But it really has to be a much more sophisticated process now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's communicating with your employees for months, if not years in advance on the advantages that your model has uh, to the workplace. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're basically creating a brand, right, that we Mm -hmm. talked about. You can't just tell people about it. You have to show them. And your actions are going to obviously speak louder than words, as the expression goes. Well, and and that's a lot of the advice that we we offer to our clients as well, talking about, you know, em, your employer brand, making sure you're communicating that well online. With that in mind, how can we begin to catch up with unions when it comes to these digital communication tools and messages? You know, I, I think uh, employers need to realize there there are, still are a lot of tools in their toolbox. Um, you know, the, the most important one and the one that's free is treating your employees with respect without pandering to them. Mm -hmm. And that comes from the CEO. It comes from the C-suite. You hear it time and again when employees uh, see that the C-suite is in their own tower, in their own corner, and not communicating with the employees and not seen as being out there. That can fester. That lingers in the workplace. Uh, And digital communications gives you a way to communicate really cheaply, really easily. Uh, And so one of the things we've seen is employers sort of create landing pages, not just for their customers or other businesses, Mm -hmm. but for their employees as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And and it's not just about the new hires, right? New hires are the people you're, you're trying to sell on your company to come in. But you're really also reminding employees about the workplace and then listening to them, soliciting their suggestions Mm -hmm. um, and try to figure out ways to get them to participate and have a sort of ownership stake in the company. That could be through everything from affinity groups to an ombudsman program, complaint mechanisms. And at the end of the day, a well-trained HR staff can be that eyes and ears Mm -hmm. um, and a a funnel for that information in some ways as well. And I think you make a really good point about it needing to be two-way communication, that you're not just putting things out there for people to consume. You actually want them to give feedback and, and share their thoughts. These digital efforts really require skill sets that we haven't needed to foster within our traditional labor relations and human resources groups. I'm talking about social media strategists with a deep understanding of the platforms, computer programmers. Should companies be adding people like that to our teams right now? In a perfect world, sure. In a practical world, I'm not sure that's going to uh, move the needle. Mm -hmm. And it's a hard sell, right? It's 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 a hard sell because it doesn't necessarily add value Mm -hmm. to the bottom line Mm -hmm. of a company. And so while I would say, yeah, that's great. Let's, let's hire more people with the skill set. What probably uh, companies will end up doing is using their existing workforce and try to bolster their skill sets there. Um, And part of that can be through work with uh, communication strategists. Some of it is uh, brand strategy and marketing uh, as well. But I think the, the notion that everyone should take away from it is, It's not just any one person's job. It's everyone's job. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's perhaps a little too simplistic, but I think that's the only way companies can successfully uh, move forward with their employees. And if they don't want a union in their workplace, um, have a chance of, of doing that. And, and, you know, despite all the advantages that, that it, unions have when organizing with changes in the law and speedy elections, mm-hmm. um, employers can still win those battles. Um, but they have to be fighting that battle now, not 
uh, six months from now or a year from now when you're hearing about yeah. it. Yeah, proactively for sure. So are there legal considerations that specifically come into play when we talk about a company's online communications, um, even you know connected to, to online organizing, but also just communicating with employees? Yeah, the, the simplest and best law that employers should be aware of is that it's unlawful for an employer and the, the, the words are interfere with, restrain, coerce employees in the exercise of the rights. So um, you can't, if you hear about a union organizing campaign, threaten or interrogate, you know, even spy on your mm -hmm. uh, your employees or, or even promising benefits if they just somehow forget about <laughs> uh, a union in some ways. So I think you want to avoid those tactics. And I think, you know, having legal counsel guide mm -hmm. uh, your cam campaign is critical. Yeah. Um, that has to be a, a, a good component for it. And it's it's not necessarily a pitch for, for, for law firms, but rather a, hey, you know, think about this at the outset rather than bringing in lawyers at the end to try to clean up your mess. It's really going to be too late. Yeah, for sure. Well said. So Dan, you're a partner at Shipman and Goodwin. Can you tell our audience a little bit about your firm? Yeah, we are a Connecticut-based firm with a regional practice and a national presence in some other areas. So I do a lot of employment law. So we've got about uh, 20 to 25 people just doing labor and employment uh, law issues. But a lot of us cross areas. So I do a lot with non-competes or um, other business type disputes uh, that touch on employment issues, but uh, go beyond that. So, you know, like a lot of law firms in this area, we are, uh, we fight above our weight class when it mm -hmm. comes to uh, to size. So let's talk a little bit about your blog, the Connecticut Employment Law Blog. You've been at that for 15 years, like I mentioned. What inspired you to start blogging? <laughs> So uh, in college, I worked for a, uh, a daily newspaper and half my friends became lawyers and half my friends worked for a newspaper. And I've got <laughs> friends now who are managing editors uh, of, of various newspapers around the, uh, the country. But one of my dream jobs at one point in time was to be like an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. I always thought that was a cool job. Mm -hmm. And so a blog gave me an opportunity uh, to write. Uh, mm -hmm. As you might imagine, writing legal briefs isn't necessarily the most uh, exciting thing to write. Uh, and so blogging gave me uh, originally an outlet for the writing, uh, but it's blossomed far beyond that to relationships, to um, communicating. Uh, it's been one of the best things that I've done, both for my career, but also my uh, personal growth. I love that. So if we want to find out more about you or your blog or your firm, where can we go? Well, we can go first to my firm at uh, shipmangoodwin.com. You can also go to CT Employment Law Blog, just as it sounds. Or uh, my favorite party trick is just type in Connecticut Employment Law or Connecticut Employment Law Blog into mm -hmm. Google. And if Google says that I'm I'm there, it must be okay. It must be legit, right? Yeah. All right. I want to let everybody know that links to Danielle's article, the Wired article, a link to Shipman and Goodwin's website, all of that will be included in this episode's companion guide. So be sure to unlock that today at projectionsinc.com slash podcast. Right now, though, Dan, it is time for our lightning round questions. And these are questions we ask of every guest of the podcast. Are you ready? I am as ready as I can be. I will say that I once appeared on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Did I you? never got onto the hot seat. So this is my <laughs> Here's opportunity. Your hot seat. <laughs> Here's my hot seat. I'm yep. ready to go. You can be Regis Philbin. Let's go. All right, here we go. Our first question is always a topic showdown. In this episode, we've been talking about TikTok digital organizing tactics. So in light of the reference on the blog, forgive me this inevitable question. Dan, does your money jiggle jiggle or does it fold? I want it to jiggle jiggle, but it folds. <laughs> Very good. All right, next question. What is the best book you've read recently? Best book is Maria Konnikova's The Biggest Bluff. It's kind of about poker, but not really. Very nice. So what is your favorite thing about the work that you do? It's the people, the people I work with, the clients I work with. And I've learned over time, if you don't love the people you work with or interact with, it'll be a really long work day. That's for sure. All right. Next is what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? 
I, it came from a judge when I was a young lawyer, and he reminded all the young lawyers that the work we do is a profession, not just a business, and that we have a bigger goal in mind, not just protecting clients, but doing justice. And uh, that was really sage advice. Mm -hmm, for sure. All right, last question. Who or what inspires you? I take a lot of inspiration from uh, from everywhere, but my mom, who is a teacher, mm -hmm. principal, and superintendent of schools, is uh, right up there. I love that. Dan, this episode has left us all with so much to think about. I can't thank you enough for sharing your experiences and your perspective. Great to be with you, and uh, thanks so much for having me. I also want to thank our listeners. Don't forget that we listened back to this episode for you and took great notes, and you can grab those notes for free at projectionsinc.com slash podcast. If you're ready for your Project HR debut, our team is always looking for outstanding guests. Let us know about your expertise at projecthr at iriconsultants.com. Don't forget to subscribe to Project HR. A new episode drops every Thursday. Drop me a line, leave me a review, or give our show a handful of stars wherever you get your content. That's all for this week's episode of Project HR. Let's make it a great day at work.